there's a lot of things as pastors that you're not allowed to say. I'm going to share some of those with you. You're just not allowed to say some things as a pastor. Uh, besides using profanity, we can't do that. Um, but here's some things you don't say. You learn really quick that you don't say certain things when you go to the hospital. One pastor learned that it's not good to walk into a patient's room with a doctor. It kind of scares the patient. Another pastor learned that you don't walk in and say something with the funeral director there. If you ever walk into a funeral, if you walk in with the funeral director, you know the first person, the first thing they're going to think is, yep, I'm dead. Um, <laughs> one pastor prayed for a church member, and when he said amen, the patient died. Now, that's not bad enough. It happened three more times. So nobody wanted the pastor to come to the hospital and pray with them. Uh, you know, there's just some things you don't say to somebody that's really sick, right? But the question then lies is, but what if it's a life or death matter? What if it, it's truly a life or death matter? What if even as hard as it may be, even if it's going to hurt, what if it could save the patient's life? What if it's difficult but life-saving? What if it could stop certain death? Would you withhold that information? Would you not say it to the patient because it, it, it would be tough? It would be hard? But you knew ultimately it was going to save their life? It had to be said? It also goes to say, what, what if somebody said, if you were ill, if you were very, very ill, and they had a life-saving prescription and said, you know, I don't care, I don't care what happens to you one way or the other. Well, what would you do? How many of you would be a little upset if the person coming into the hospital said, yeah, I don't care one way or the other what happens to you. The doctor comes in and says, I don't care whether you live or die, whatever. It is what it is. How many would be happy with that? Oh, you have somebody like, wait a minute, he said happy, no. In fact, what if I stood up here and said, you know what? I don't care what happens at Salem one way or the other. How long would I have a job? But, <laughs> wow, and I've known you for years. Uh, that's probably what would happen. Now, why does all that matter? Well, there's this weird phrase that's been going around for several years that there are a lot of churches in our country that are referred to as zombie churches. Doesn't that sound weird? Zombie churches. They're churches who have long since died, but nobody knew to have how to have how to have the funeral. And so they just go on going through the paces. They died, but nobody was bold enough to say, hey, we should probably have a funeral. In fact, Tom Rayner wrote a book about it called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Anybody ever read Autopsy of a Deceased Church? One or two of you? Yeah, if you get a chance, it's kind of scary. He said as many as 360,000 to 400,000 churches in America are showing severe decline toward death. They have become zombie churches. Now what's sad, it doesn't have to be that way. But nobody had the boldness enough to say to them, you got to stop. This has got to stop now. You can reverse the course. Well, why does all that mean anything? Because that is exactly... What was happening to the church in Sardis in Revelations 3, verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Uh, as you do, let me share this with you. 700 years before this letter was written to the church in Sardis, Sardis was one of the greatest cities in the known world. It set on a vital trade route that ran east to west and the junction of five major roads. Sardis was so wealthy that it was said of them that the river around the town flowed with gold. And in fact, there, were, there was gold in the hills, Gold dust, gold flakes up on the mountains. And sure enough, that if you stood back, it was so filled with, the rivers were so filled with gold dust that they said when the sunlight hit it, it glimmered gold. This city had it all. That's was Sardis. Wealthy, literally river floating and flowing with gold. 
Now, we're going to unpack this a little at a time, so let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are, what does it say? Dead. Now, let's clarify something real quick. Verse 1 does not mean that there are seven gods. In Hebrews, in the Hebrew language, numbers had a meaning. Numbers had significance. The number seven was the number that symbolized perfection or fullness. And so when Jesus says, he that hath the seven spirits of God, he is saying that he is the one that has the fullness of the spirit of God. And he brings all that to bear in this moment in the church in Sardis. Now, there are seven characteristics of the spirit of God. Isaiah wrote about it in chapter 11. This is what it reads. The spirit of the Lord will rest to him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So there are the seven spirits of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits of God. Now, here's what, something that's interesting he says about Sardis. Do you know what with Sardis, he never names one thing wrong? He doesn't name one thing good. Neither way. He didn't have anything to say to him at all other than, you are dead. Oh, you look alive, but you're dead. There's nothing to criticize. Because there's nothing good going on, nothing bad going on. Verse 1, he says, you are a zombie church. You lack a brain. You're going through the motions. From the outside, you look alive, but inside, you might as well be a grave. That's a scary thing to be accused of, isn't it? The church had relied on its reputation. They're just going through the motions. There's no heartbeat. There's no breath. There isn't even any dysfunction. It was relying on its past and its wealth. It's doing nothing of value. And in doing so, they had just died. But nobody wanted to admit it. There's a church I read of many years ago. And at least they had the good sense enough. It was a church in Chicago. They had been a thriving church at one time. And it had dwindled down to eight people. And nobody decided, nobody wanted to have the funeral. Nobody wanted to admit, we have run our course. We are worthless to the kingdom of God right now. We're done. They had a million dollars in the bank. A million dollars in the bank. And eight members. They were meeting in somebody's living room. But somebody was smart enough in this church. One of the eight was smart enough and had enough spirit about them that they said, hey, you know what? Guys, we need to call it quits. <laughs> Let's have our final service. And for the kingdom of God, we're going to take our million dollars and we're going to give it to the church association so they can go plant thriving churches. See, at least they had the good sense enough to have the funeral. Not Sardis. How does a church get that way? I mean, because think about it. Dead churches don't start out that way, do they? Wouldn't that be weird? Hey, let's plant a church in two years plan to fail. It's like, it's like a couple. We do premarital counseling. I have never met a couple who says, you know what? Yeah, we're going to get married, but in a couple of years, we're going to get divorced. If I ever heard that, there would be no wedding. So no church starts out to fail. So how in the world did Sardis get to that point? Well, it's the same thing that infects most churches, if not all. It all starts with pride. Everybody loves to pat everybody on the back. Look what we have done. We got money. We got a big building. I mean, you'll hear it in things like this. Why, I remember in the 40s, or pick a decade, when people were hanging out the window. We made a name for ourselves. 
We had so many people coming, the people that had to join the choir just to have a seat. You hear that pride bubbling up? It's like a church I know of. They were running 22 people on Sunday morning in a sanctuary that seated 1,100 people. And they were running 22. It at one point was so big, they literally had to let Sunday school out early or nobody would get a seat. And people told me that when they were there as kids, when you got out of Sunday school, you ran to the sanctuary. You had to run to the sanctuary to get a seat. And this is a Baptist church. It was so full that even the front row was full. And does that tell you? I mean, look, okay? It was thriving. What happened? Downtown Nashville, huge edifice of a building. It had no heartbeat. I will tell you, they were smart enough that a few years ago, they gave all of their property to another church for a church plant so that the thriving church would continue to exist. Church like that, everybody starts patting themselves on the back. We have arrived, so we're going to skate on this the rest of our lives. They congratulate themselves, and they think about the past, whatever decade they choose. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to forget the past. Hey, sometimes if you forget the past, you're going to repeat it. So you need to remember the past. Nostalgia itself is not bad. We need to remember when. The problem is we can't live in the past. How many of you know that 1950 is not coming back? It's okay to remember. I love great memories. They make great testimonies, don't they? But we have to move on. The problem with zombie churches, dying churches, is they never move on. Ever. And what happens in that moment is comfort sets in. Don't we love our comfort? How many of you sit in the same pew every Sunday? Nothing wrong with that, but let's be honest. It's because we're comfortable there, right? If we had to sit on the other side, if I asked you right now, this side, stand up, this side, stand up, swap places. Y'all would freak out. <laughs> right? Because we get comfortable. It's not, saying this, not all comfort's a bad thing. There's a guy named A.W. Tozer who I love his writing. He wrote a book called Rot, Rut, or Revival. Isn't that a great title? Rot, rut, or revival. He wrote about the comfort problem that Israel had. He said Israel's problem was that they had given up hope of ever getting the land God had promised them. They had become so satisfied with going in circles and camping in nice, comfortable places, food being provided for them, water being provided for them, that they had come under the spell of the psychology of the routine. And they were comfortable with their routine. And what happens is it kept them from where they were supposed to be. It prevented them from receiving the riches that God had promised them. And you know what happens after that? After comfort sets in? Once we're all nice and comfortable, the next thing that kicks in is laziness. Now that they've arrived, right? Now that they're in their routine, now that they're comfortable with the routine and they're comfortably satisfied with themselves, they start thinking, well... Since we've made a name for ourselves here in Sardis, we'll just open the doors and the whole world will flock to us. Let's just stand in the doorway, wave and say, y'all come. And of course they'll come because after all, it's us. We're wonderful. We're perfect. We just stand in the door. We'll stand at the edge of the road and wave. Y'all come. I know what church, this is no joke. They put somebody on the street wearing Mickey Mouse gloves. You know the big Mickey Mouse gloves? Those big, y'all know what I'm talking about? Up and down is yes, side to side is no. And they would wave before the church service started. I'm like, I won't touch that one. I'll let that one go. The trail of people starts to slowly trickle off. The stream of people starts to dry up. Enthusiasm starts to wane, and the pulse is barely beating. 
Tozer wrote again, he said, if we evangelicals had one-third of the enthusiasm of some of the cults, we would take a continent. We have power available to us that they do not. We have a lazy bunch of evangelicals on our hands. Now, the problem is you go from the comfort to then being lazy, and you know what sets in next? Apathy. No, one's on a, no one would ever say we no longer care. Well, that would be unholy, right? That wouldn't be the Sunday school answer. They just don't care anymore. It sounds terribly wrong, but even... How many of you read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters? Some of us? Anybody? Okay. In screw tape letters, the devil is saying to his nephew, his nephew's name is Wormwood, and he is training Wormwood for effective service for Satan to the world. This is what he said to his nephew. He said, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are bad people. Your job, dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care. And so a church that reaches this place huddles together around a potluck to remember the good old days. Talking about the nasty world out there. And the only time besides Sunday that they get together is at the next funeral. The funeral funeral director, i.e. the pastor, keeps prepping the weekly memorial service. I read a story about a young pastor. One of his first churches. He's staring out the window in his office, in his study, just sobbing and weeping. He looks out the window at this busy scene of people going up and down the street. And he saw drug dealers and prostitutes and junkies and panhandlers and thieves. And he's just standing there weeping. One of the longtime church members walked up beside him and put his hand gently on his shoulder. The man said, Pastor, don't worry. After a while... You'll get used to it. The pastor said, yes, I know. That's why I'm crying. See, Jesus then tells Sardis, though, you're a zombie church, but there's still hope. Look what he says in verses 2 through 6. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember... What you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Unlike our other churches in these letters, there was no conflict in Sardis. Not one. There was no pressure on them from the outside. There was no pressure on them from the inside. Nobody was persecuting them. Nobody was talking bad about them. And in fact, nobody was talking about them at all. Sardis sat on a hill. You have to understand some history real quick. Sardis sat on a hill 1,500 feet above the plain. And it was all surrounded by cliffs. No army could scale the cliffs. They got really comfortable. We don't need an army. We're so high, nobody will ever get to us. There's only one way in and one way out. But in 549 B.C., Cyrus, the Persian king, and his army at night climbed the steep cliffs. But a very cocky and complacent and lazy people of Sardis were sound asleep. No guards on the wall, no sentries at the gate, no watchmen looking out over the plain. And when the people of Sardis woke up on, on that morning, they were surrounded by the Persian army inside their own walls. Completely caught unaware. You would think that would teach you a lesson, wouldn't you? Nope. 
In 214 BC, it happened to their great great grandchildren. Same mindset. They got comfortable, they got lazy, they got apathetic, and the city fell in the exact same way it had hundreds of years before. So when Jesus tells the church in Sardis, you become watchful, you wake up, or I will come like a thief in the night, they understood that all too well because it had happened twice before, surprised in the middle of the night like a thief. So Jesus is telling them, listen, you need to remember where this whole thing started. You need to remember why you started this. Remember the very basics that you were told. He's actually telling them, look, look, in, look into your past and pinpoint where this thing went wrong. Pinpoint it. Identify it. It's okay to tell the patient, hey, back here 15, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, you basically died out. Go remember that, and once you can identify it, then you can start fixing things. This is what happened. Let's not do that again. Let's go back and do the things we started with. The problem is they are about to become extinct. The flame of life in in the church in Sardis is about to go out. But I will tell you, there is this amazing message of hope for the church and for those zombie churches today. Before they experience a full cardiac arrest. You know, the widowmaker type. It seems in Sardis, there was still a weak pulse. The patient was not gone just yet. And he says, I'm giving you the chance. I want a, I want a real revival here. He said, now, notwithstanding your spiritual deadness, there are some of you. And a lot of you, but there's a small remnant that have not let themselves become fat, dumb, and lazy. Take a listen, lesson from that, and f- you better fix now what soon could be unfixable. How many of you have a check engine light on your car? How many of you believe the way to fix it is a piece of tape over it? You know, like the old Midas commercial, you pay me now or pay me later. That's what Jesus is saying to this church. You can pay me now, or you can pay me later. But it's still fixable. For the disciple in churches whose fire had all but died out and grown cold, he's saying, listen, there are embers of hope. So as bad as it is, as much as you appear dead, he never says all hope is lost. He tells him. You can become alive again. Just wake up to what's going on around you. Wake up to the reality of your situation. Wake up to how you're supposed to be living. Wake up to what is true and what right. Wake up to the opportunities to grow as a disciple. Watch for opportunities to reach others. Work and watch like I might come back tomorrow because guess what? I might. The prescription... It, not just for Sardis, it's for those thousands of churches who were headed for death every year. They, didn't ha- they don't have to. It's like the other, reason, the other letters that Jesus has written. He says, repent. You know why it's hard for people to repent? You know why it's hard for churches as a whole to repent? How many of you enjoy admitting out loud that you were horribly, horribly wrong? And nobody likes being told that, right? Because once you say it out loud, you've got to admit it. But once you say it out loud and once you've admitted it, what do you have to do? Change it. C.H. Spurgeon preached on repentance week after week. Many years ago in London, C.H. Spurgeon would preach on repentance week after week. Somebody came up to him and said, when are you going to quit preaching on repentance, pastor? He said, when you repent. The only thing that will reanimate the body of Christ, the only thing that will restore life, is the only thing that gave the church life to start with, and that is the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the breath of life. The Holy Spirit brought from repentance. The, the breath of, it's the same breath of God that brought life to Adam. It's the same thing in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing wind and empowered 120 people to share the gospel. And let me tell you something, church, when the the Holy Spirit breathes on a church, it will come alive. 
It's like this. How many of you have like, like fires and bonfires? Anybody? Like setting stuff on fire? When I was in Boy Scouts many, many years ago, I, I love fires. I like to start them, set them. I mean, start them. Um, I like to get them going when there's nothing left, right? And this, I have to share this with you because it's, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I, I love being transparent. I, I went in scouts, and I was the one that was always in charge of starting the fire and then in the morning restarting the fire, which was easier because what's left overnight. There's some embers. There's some coals. I was so good at getting a dead fire to reignite, they nicknamed, nicknamed me Dragon Breath. Don't laugh. That's not funny. That's how good I was. That's how much I love fire. And Jesus has said, you let the Holy Spirit breathe on this church, and those little embers that are left, that little bitty group of people who haven't, who haven't given up yet, watch them catch fire, watch them come alive. See, as long as there's a few embers remaining, the fire can be strong again. With a strong wind, with the stirring up there is, it comes back to life. But like a body, the church also needs the blood of Christ. We need the breath of the Spirit. We need the blood of Jesus Christ coursing through every vein in the church. Social causes are good. Don't get me wrong. But at the core, if the core is it isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ, if the reason isn't to connect people with Jesus, it comes up short. Many, churches, many church programs are great. I don't have a problem with, 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 with programs. But if they are absent of Jesus Christ... You might as well have a community center. Everything, every program, every committee, every team should have this at the center of it. In every church, what does Jesus want of us? Or the question, how will this help people see Jesus in us? You know, you've heard about the scarecrow, right? Wizard of Oz, come on now. If I only had a... It's the same thing for a church. You need the breath of life and the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ, and you need a brain focused on the gospel. Actually, it's a brain that's focused constantly on prayer. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, pray... Okay, you can finish that sentence for me. Pray... Without ceasing. That was always on their mind. The early church, prayer was not an afterthought. It was always a forethought. You know, you've heard that if there's no brain activity, the patient is dead. Right? You've heard that? Yeah, once a church becomes prayerless, it becomes powerless. And is on a slow decline to death. However... If a church sets its mind calling out to God without ceasing, God will always answer. Let me say that again because I don't want to make sure you didn't miss that. If a church will set its mind on praying without ceasing, calling out to God, God will always answer. If a church sets its mind to calling out that constantly, and I'm not talking about just prayer before, you know, Wednesday night dinner. I'm talking about in classes, in small groups throughout the week, in prayer meetings. Because let me tell you something, when the spirit of prayer falls on a church, God answers and things start coming to life. Let me say that again. When a church sets its mind to calling out to God, God will answer and things start happening. Amazing things start happening. How many, have how many of you love seeing miracles? Okay, everybody should be raising their hand. Come on. Give the Sunday school answer this time. We do. When a church sets its mind on, the, on praying without ceasing, you can watch miracles start to happen in the body of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, the world takes note that that is a church that is alive for Jesus Christ. 
Prayer and the vitality of a church go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. If you find a vital, a vitally exciting, growing, amazing church, you can always trace it back to a mind set on prayer. Charles Spurgeon, years ago, um, he was teaching a seminary course. He had a college. And so one of the requirements was the seminary class had to come to a worship service at, his, at, at Metropolitan Tabernacle, which is what his church was. And so they did. A whole bunch of them showed up uh, for, for service that day. They were early. And this old man met them at the door. And he, he said, they said, well, we're here for the class. We, we're, because we're in the class seminary, we have to come to worship here. Uh, Dr. Spurgeon says we have to, so we're here. The old man said, you want to see what fires up this church? What heats up this church? They were like, they had to be polite, right? They're like, mm, okay, whatever. So the man took him into the basement underneath the sanctuary and opened the door. And inside that room were 700 people on their knees in prayer. And he said, that's what lights this church up. That sets the fire in this church. If you find a vital church, I can promise you beyond a shadow of a doubt that at the core of who they are is prayer. But past that, you have to have this beating heart for the lost. See, when, when, the, when, the, when the heart of a church beats for the lost in the community, you will also see it come back to life. Almost as if a doctor had taken a defibrillator and restarted the heart. It's about the church becoming literally heart-obsessed to reach the community. Somebody from a, a church that was dying, but now this church is a vibrant, living thing. This is how they put it. We became determined in the power of God to discover what it would take to be Christ in the community. We had never asked that question before. They simply said... What's it going to take of us to be Jesus to our community? So, sir, church, every, every church has a God-given prescription for life, not death. But it's like any prescription a doctor would give to a dying patient. If a doctor says to somebody, hey, look, I had this medication. It's guaranteed to work. If you take this every day for the rest of your life, you will live a long, healthy life. Now, if the patient were to say, hey, no thanks, I'm good. That doesn't work for me. I know what's best. I'm going to do what I want to do. Would, not, would we not think that individual was crazy? It's like, wait, 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 wait a minute. The doctor just said to take this one little pill, and there's no bad side effects. If you'll just take this pill, you will live a long, healthy, vibrant life. But didn't they look at the doctor and go, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm comfortable where I am. I don't want to have to do anything extra. I guarantee the doctor would say that I'm done with you. Wouldn't he? I can't help you if you will not help yourself. Here's a prescription. But that's what happens to far too many churches. Jesus has warned them of their death. He's called them to wake up. He has given them the prescription of hope in Sardis. And he promises, you will come back to life. And that promise still holds true. There's hope for you. See, what happened, the reason churches become apathetic in zombie churches isn't because they all decided at one time to do it. It's because one person decided to do it. And then the next person decided to do it. Well, if they're not going to do any work, I'm not going to work any harder. Anybody heard that? Don't, say, don't raise your hand to that. Well, if they're not going to serve, I'm not going to serve. Well, I've got to do all the work myself. But the, the key is there's hope for any disciple, for any church, to have life and to have it more abundantly. Now, I will tell you this. I really thought about this this past two weeks preparing for this. And, and can I just say, and I'm not trying to stroke anybody's feathers, Salem 
is not Sardis. Let's say that again. Salem is not Sardis. We got some work to do. But we are not a zombie. The more prayer we pour on this, the bigger the fire gets. You breathe out that prayer, the bigger the fire gets. One pastor from, I don't know, it's probably 200 years ago. He said, and he would, he would preach open air. He'd get on a hillside like this and just start preaching. Thousands would come. 10,000, 15,000 would come. And this was before the days of microphones. And he would stand on a hillside and preach for an hour to 15,000 people. He was asked one day, they said, how in the world do you get 15,000 people to come see you? He said, I just let the Spirit set me on fire. They come to watch me burn. Now, why do I say that? Because we're going we're to let the Spirit breathe on this church with a hungry and a heart for the lost and a brain set on constantly praying that God sets this church on fire and people from this community just come watch us burn and warm themselves up next to the fire.